Um, a very warm welcome to all of you on the webinar on flipping the ZLD and brine management model, growth in the era of industrial water scarcity. And this webinar has been sponsored by IDE Technologies as well as Chem Process Systems. I'm Ritika Arora, Director of uh, Research with India Infrastructure, and I'll be moderating this webinar along with my colleague Nikita Chhabra, who's the Associate Director and our water sector expert as well. Before we begin now uh, with the webinar, I will just spend about three, four minutes uh, just giving you a brief background for the context in which that is, this is being organized and uh, what is the vision behind it, and also a few words about IDE. And then uh, the format will be that we will first be having a presentation by Mr. Matan um, and Mr. Jayesh. This will be a joint presentation and uh, this will go on for about uh, 50 minutes to an hour. And after the presentation, we will have a half an hour uh, Q&A discussion um, on their presentations. So one um, request is there for all the participants that do keep typing in your questions as and when they strike you during the course of the presentation and you don't necessarily have to wait for the presentation to end to keep sending in your questions. However, we will take all the questions once the presentation um, ends. After the presentation, we will also have a panel uh, where we have more senior experts from IDE who have already joined in and uh, the questions will be addressed to the entire panel uh, jointly. So once again, request for all the participants uh, to keep typing in their questions. The chat and the Q&A have both been enabled to all of you. Do keep typing your questions there um, and we will be taking it at the end of the presentation. Um, for most of you uh, must be aware, but I will just talk about IDE. IDE Technologies is headquartered in Israel and is a world leader in desalination and water treatment solutions. It specializes in development, engineering, construction, and operation of some of the world's largest and most advanced thermal and membrane desalination facilities and industrial water treatment plants as well. Over the years, it has partnered with a wide range of customers, including municipalities, oil and gas segment, mining, refineries, and power plants on all aspects of water projects. And they also deliver approximately 3 million meter cubic per day of high quality water worldwide. Uh, while working on the priorities of their industrial customers in India, ID had executed an elaborated exercise uh, to know the gap into the ever evolving uh, ZLD mandate. And this session uh, aims to outline the same and to also offer a reliable and a novel solution and partnership for the Indian industrial water treatment uh, market. And this will be done mostly through a presentation, as I mentioned before, which will be for about 50 to 55 minutes. And this will be a joint presentation by Mr. Matan uh, Alpur and uh, Mr. Jayesh Parik. I will just uh, quickly introduce both of them. Uh, in a minute or so. So Mr. Matan holds a BSc in Chemical Engineering from uh, Technion uh, Israel Institute of Technology and an MBA from Tel Aviv University where he specialized in strategy and entrepreneurship. Uh, he's the product manager in the product management and business development unit of the company. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Jayesh Parikh, who's the founder, chairman and managing director of Chem Process Systems Private Limited. He has an extensive 35 years of core experience and special expertise in vacuum, evaporation, crystallization, drying, desalination, and heat transfer. And with his expertise in the fields of process engineering, process solutions, management, and technology, combined with his ability and dedication, he has helped uh, grow Chem Process from scratch into a multi-million multi uh, dollar company today. So a very warm welcome to all the experts from IDE. And uh, later on, I will also introduce, uh, short, give short introductions uh, to the other panelists as well. But uh, without further ado, I think we can uh, begin with the presentation. And over to Mr. Matan now. Uh, he will be beginning the presentation and then Mr. Jayesh will be proceeding with it. Go, go ahead, Matan, now. Over to you. Thank you very much, Radhika, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Again, thanks for joining us and welcome to this webinar on flipping the ZLB and brine management model. I'm happy to be here today and I hope everyone is obviously safe and healthy. Uh, again, my name is Matan Alper. I'm a product, management, a product manager at ID Technologies. And today we will be talking about the Indian industry water needs and how IDE and Kempro systems change the conventional ZLD and brine management model to provide a more cost-effective and efficient solutions. So without any further ado, let's see what we have in store for today. 
So we will start with a few words on IDE for those who are not familiar with us. We will discuss a bit about the different industries in India and their different Indian market industry and their different water needs and challenges. Then we'll discuss a bit about conventional industrial water treatment and see how ID and Campro tackles this to provide a more cost-effective approach. We will present our two high recovery membrane-based technologies and present our new partnership with Camp Process Systems that provides a robust and cost-effective thermal solutions to the Indian industrial market. And finally, we'll wrap it up with a summary and then we'll have a wide panel to answer questions. So let's begin. So ID was established in 1965, and since then we've been a leader in providing advanced water treatment solutions, including desalination, industrial wastewater, and reuse, both in membrane and thermal technologies. Since 65, ID has installed more than 400 plants over 40 countries. And as you can see, we have offices and representations around the world in the US, China, obviously India, Chile and Australia, with the headquarters being in Israel. Now, ID provides a wide range of advanced water treatment solutions. The first is, of course, desalination, where ID has a special experience in designing and building mega sized projects around the world. In addition, we have extensive exp experience with modular plants aimed to minimize civil and construction work. Next, we have industrial water treatment, where ID knows to offer an end-to-end -end solution with our thermal and high recovery RO systems as the core technology. And lastly, ID is well invested in wastewater reuse treatment with our PFRO chloramine-free treatment. ID designs and builds the plants. We are not an engineering company per se, since we don't sell engineering and we are not a consultant. We provide the full end-to-end -end solution and give process guarantees with it. Now, besides the different types of water treatment application, one of ID's main advantages is its flexibility in the delivery methods of projects. What it means is that ID performs EPC projects, water sale projects, whether it's BOT, private-public partnerships, and so on. And in addition, ID also offers O&M services and operates many of its own installations. Now, this is something quite unique for an EPC water treatment company. The fact that we also operate many of our installations says something about our EPC project standards. We build plants as if we were to operate it. This means that they are built with the highest standards, of course, and a strong emphasis on long-term operation. Now, let's begin to dive into uh, some of the uh, gaps that we've recognized in the Indian industry. So we recently performed an extensive survey to examine and assess the water gaps in the Indian industrial market. And we've contacted dozens of plants and companies from various sectors and various industries. And before we dive in, when we summarize all the industry's feedback, we come up with five main points. One is water obviously will be a strategic issue as most industrial expansions, expansions will have to manage based on their existing sources or with treated sewage from municipals. Now, the second one is services as most industries prefer to do their own ETP operation but they do need a solution provider to support uh, during and post commissioning. And on ZLD, multi-effect evaporator is probably the most dominant technology in ZLD applications. It's usually imposed by the government and because of that fact, it has led to some sort of a shortcut approach where many of evaporators are not working properly or even not working at all. On regulation, uh, we see that it's becoming more and more strict as we go and more monitoring is being enforced. And finally, in terms of solutions, there is some sort of an illusion in the industrial water treatment world where there are many end-to-end -end water companies. 
where actually, in fact, there are only a few suppliers or solution providers that have the knowledge or the proven track record to combine and integrate many types of solutions, such as membranes, thermal, pretreatment, and so on. So when we look at the heavy petroleum industry, um, we see that it's globally the third largest consumer of crude oil in the world. And it's characterized by near-term brownfield expansions. And we also see that there is a reduction in private sector spends due to the COVID impact. Now, the heavy petroleum industry is mostly in the public sector, and we can see it's dominated by main three companies, Reliance, BPCIL, IOC. And when we look at the regulatory or growth challenges, we see and expect that inland freshwater and wastewater, wastewater discharge restrictions will increase and get more strict. There is also difficulty to expand operations because of the lack of additional water and the difficulty to get more ETP discharge permissions. So what are the expectations of this industry from a water treatment solution provider? First, it's the ability to design and supply large scale integrated wastewater solutions. It's also to have knowledge in the process itself, in the refinery processes and wastewater chemistries, not just water. And they expect us to support and have the ability to support during and post commissioning. When we look at the chemical industry in India, we see that it's a major production hub with over 80,000 commercial chemical products with a strong emphasis on refining. Now, local manufacturing is, will probably increase dramatically due to domestic demand and more government support. This is mostly a private sector where there are several players such as Aditya Birla, DCM, Nirma, Tata Chemicals, and so on. And the challenges they face are that ZLD enforcement is expected to increase. And obviously water reuse and reusing what you have and not uh, depend on new water sources will also increase due to the expansion needs. Also, we see that large companies will probably further drive corporate sustainability goals because of investors' mandates. So again, the expectations here are quite similar. First is to have an understanding of wastewater chemistry and the ability to conduct treatability and demo studies. The water solution provider needs to be able to design flexible ETP uh, designs to accommodate the changes in the product mix and the product quality, and to be able to design a robust ZLD system with the ability to recover as much high quality condensate. The power industry. So again, this is the globally, in India, it's the third largest power producer uh, in the world with new thermal plants stuck at the moment because of various reasons such as land acquisition, fuel, and so on, and it's likely to be worsened. And this is a share of private sectors such as uh, NTPC, Reliance, Adani, Tata, and also um, state-owned NTPC. And the challenges here is that we also see in the power industry that compliance is getting more strict in treated sewage water intake and FGD system installations. And we see that existing systems in very old plants would probably find it difficult to achieve reduction in cooling water requirements because of the old systems. So the expectation here is to try and provide a cost competitive uh, approach in a very saturated and low growth industry. It's the ability to provide large scale, again, reliable high recovery systems. And very importantly, it's to be able to integrate with existing systems, such as STP and ETP plants surrounding the power plants, and to have long-term partnerships for integrated water solutions. And finally, the heavy chemical or fertilizer industry. And again, we see a growth uh, due to uh, domestic consumption and the shift 
of production from China. It's a slow but steady growth for the fertilizer industry. And it's a few large companies on coastal regions where fertilizers are more govern government owned because of the very direct links to agriculture. So challenges very similar. Again, ZLD enforcement in inland plants, fresh water restrictions on new plants and expansions. And we see limits or difficulty in recycling and reusing cooling water blowdown. So the expectations are quite similar again is to be able to provide large scale, reliable, high recovery systems, to have again expertise in management of specific water chemistry. And something else is also achieving ZLD with non-thermal means, giving the large scale of, op of operation and the fact that we understand and know that thermal systems are very high in CAPEX and OPEX. So now that, now that we've quite quickly and very briefly, obviously, shared some of our insights on the different challenges the industry is facing in, Indus, in, in India in regards to water and their expectations from water treatment solution provider, let's discuss what is industrial water treatment training? What is an actual end-to-end -end solution? So in this slide, you can see the typical industrial water treatment approach where usually you have a pretreatment stage followed by a conventional membrane solution, followed by a massive thermal evaporator, and finally a crystallizer if you want to go full ZLD. However, this solution is not very cost effective. It relies mostly on the thermal part, which we all know is expensive and requires significant maintenance. This is why it's super important to minimize the thermal part as much as possible. Doing so will result in a more robust and efficient process with lower capital and operating costs. Now, this obviously seems very obvious and you're probably wondering why it's not being done already. And this is exactly the challenge. Reaching high recoveries and high salinities with membrane-based solutions is a technological challenge. This is exactly what IDE, IDE has developed to minimize the thermal part as much as possible, thus making the entire treatment train more efficient. What you can see here below is IDE's treatment train, IDE's and Chempro's treatment train with a significant reduction of the thermal part by implementing high recovery, innovative membrane solutions to try and push the membrane potential as far as it can reach, and only then implementing smaller thermal solutions. And we'll talk more about it in the next slides. So industrial water is, is quite a very general term, and it relates to various types of water qualities. These are just a few, just really a few industrial water streams and each has its own unique features and own unique characteristics. So when we say industrial water, we understand it's a complex water balance. We obviously wish to reuse and recycle as much of it, both from an economical point of view, but also since regulation and water scarcity are increasing. And the unique thing about industrial water treatment compared with other sorts of water treatment is that it's usually, it usually requires the integration of several solutions and several technologies. Now, IDE designs and builds end-to-end -end solutions from pretreatment, brackish, seawater RO, high recovery membrane, thermal technologies, and obviously with Campro's large line of thermal solutions up to ZLD. But the point here is that for industrial water treatment, there is no one simple equipment or one simple solution. It's usually a customized, complex treatment train that requires multidiscipline expertise. Now, we act as both integrator and technology provider. It means that in some treatment stages, as you can see here, we implement our own unique technologies while taking advantage of our integration expertise for the other stages. This allows us to optimize a full end-to-end -end solution with our own unique benefits. And in addition with our new partner for ZLD Chem Process Systems, 
it enables a synergy where our combined solution is much more efficient. So why most industries just go to thermal solutions and don't treat the water with typical membrane technologies? And the reason is that industrial water treatment possesses challenges that limits conventional membrane technologies from reaching high recoveries. Industrial water usually has low salinity, which causes the chemistry of the water to act as the limiting factor and not the maximum osmotic pressure. Now the challenges are usually fouling because brine velocity is quite low, so you have a low shear force. Another problem is changes in feed. Obviously, when we're talking about industry, operation changes all the time. That means water quality and flow changes all the time. When you have systems that have one single working point, they have difficulties in managing and working under changes. Biofouling is a big issue as well, and that is caused because of stable and constant hydraulic and osmotic pressures, which increase tendency for biofouling. And scaling, obviously, long term, long time in supersaturated conditions will cause scaling. And this limits you from reaching high recoveries with membrane based solutions. So, to face these challenges, IDE has developed two membrane based solutions that are able to handle these challenges and bring new capabilities to industrial water treatment. These are the PFRO, PulseFlorRO, and the Max H2O desalter. Both technologies enable you to reach 8% TDS with membrane technologies, thus reaching the mechanical operating limitations of membranes. And the values are obviously the fact that you will have lower disposal costs. You have additional clean water. Uh, Leo, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. And smaller thermal systems, which will obviously impact dramatically the operating and capital cost of the entire treatment tram. So let's dive into the first uh, high recovery membrane solution, the Max H2O desalter. This solution combines a single stage RO membrane technology with a 30 year old integrated salt precipitation unit that addresses and solves the challenges we just discussed. This solution overcomes the inability to handle variant changes in wastewater flow and composition. It operates at very high recoveries, but without compromising membrane service life. And it pushes the limits for calcium sulfate and other sparingly soluble salts precipitation. Now the image here below is one of our first demo units currently operating uh, for cooling tower blowdown treatment in a power plant here in Israel. So let's see how the, this process looks and we'll take you quite briefly through the stages. So first, and here it's just an example of cooling tower blowdown, the raw water can go through pretreatment. This stage is optional and depends on water quality. This is just to remove TSS that is present in the water. The water then flows into one of two feed tanks. From the feed tank, the water flows to the RO stage. Now, this is a single RO stage that operates at relatively low local recovery, so about 20 to 30 percent recovery, and it's continuously producing high quality permeate to the product tank. Now, obviously anti-scaling is dosed before the RO. Now, the brine that is produced in the RO is cycled through a fluidized bed pellet reactor. This pellet reactor or crystal lactal is a pellet reactor based on DHV's technology, a Dutch company, and it has hundreds of standalone installations around the world. Now, the, the RO brine flows through the bottom of the pellet reactor, where upon contact with seeding material that is inside the reactor, the anti-scalant is deactivated and absorbed on top of the, on the seeding material. Now, as soon as the anti-scalant is deactivated, the brine 
instantaneously become supersaturated with either calcium sulfate, calcium carbonate, silica, heavy metals, and so on. And they begin to precipitate on top of the seeding material to form pellets. Now, automatically, you have to discharge pellets and you have to feed fresh pellets to compensate. But the biggest advantages here of this process is that the disposed pellets, the discharged pellets, contain over 90% dry solids. So that means no sludge production. These pellets can be easily disposed of or even sold without the need for any dewatering systems. Now, after the different salts have precipitated, the brine continues the loop and overflows from the top of the pellet reactor back to feed tank number one. That basically symbolizes the end of the loop, which is the yellow line. So it's a cyclic process. Now the brine undergoes several of these loops, getting more and more concentrated every time until we reach the osmotic pressure. And when that happens, the cycle ends and we switch automatically between the tanks and a new cycle begins with fresh raw water from the process. Now, the water from feed tank number one that we just treated can be discharged to, the, to a downstream ZLD thermal system or whatever treatment is downstream. Now, two important points regarding this process. One is that the anti-scaling dosage before the RO and the fact that we operate the RO at very low local recoveries, it gives us a very delicate control over the supersaturation levels of the brine in every loop. Now, with these two parameters, we control the saturation to be at a point that on one side, no scaling occurs at, in the RO because of the anti-scaling, but on the other side, precipitation will occur on the pellets in the reactor. And by manipulating the anti-scalant and local recovery, we use minimal amounts of chemicals to the reactor since we induce precipitation by this unique process and control and not by use or dumping of many chemicals. So if we had to graph what is happening inside this process over time, it would look something like this. The red plot represents the, the problematic salts, all the salts we want to precipitate, everything that limits recovery. And the blue plot represents the soluble salts, such as sodium chloride, over time. And as you can see, both of them increase when we pass through the RO. But as soon as the brine enters the pellet reactor, we precipitate the pro pro problematic salts, that the, that's the red line, and then another loop and another loop and another loop. So we reach osmotic pressure, but we never endanger the membranes and we never pass the anti-scalant ability. So we don't have scaling on the membranes, but we do eliminate the limiting factor of water chemistry. And now the limiting factor is only the osmotic pressure. In addition, something that we didn't discuss is that because the mechanism of this process is cyclic, changes in raw water quality, as we discussed, that's a problem in, in operations in the industry, it will not affect this process because it just means that you enter the cycle at a different point. So this system will be able to handle very dynamic nature of industrial wastewater. Oh, sorry. Um, it should have been a video. I don't know why it's not working. Okay. So in this video, you can see the fluidized bed pellet reactor in operation. You can see the amount of surface area which is provided for precipitation. And in the images, you can see how the pellets that are discharged from the reactor, how they do not require any dewatering system and no sludge production is formed. So it's basically very similar to wet sand. So now that we've talked about the desalter, let's talk a bit about our second high recovery solution, which is the PFRO. So a classic standard RO operates at constant conditions. 
In this case, you can see a three-stage typical RO system. It's typically three stages because you need to reach a high recovery. And it's also usually built in a ratio of one to two from stage to stage. And the reason is to design for this design approach is because you want to maintain a minimum brine flow to have enough shear force in the last membranes. Now in PFRO, we take a different approach. In the PFRO, there are alternating flows. Therefore, there is no longer the need to maintain this ratio of one to two. We can actually operate at high recoveries in a single stage configuration, and we create enough shear force by our alternating flow regime, which we'll see in a second. So instead of having constant flows, in the PFRO, there is a brine valve, which you can see on the screen. This brine valve dictates the system st status. You can see, you can either be in production mode or you can be in flushing mode. The way it operates is as follows. So each pressure vessel bundle, typically six pressure vessels, have a common brine valve that opens and closes. When the valve is closed, we are in production mode, as you can see now. And this is a dead end filtration. 100% of the water leaves as permeate as product. And as permeate water leaves the system, all the salts accumulate on the feed side. So the feed TDS increases, you can see in this graph. Now, when we change the mode and go into flushing mode, where the brine valve is open, in this mode, the water that was left inside the pressure vessel leaves via the, the brine pipe, and it does it very fast. So there is a high shear force created. As soon as that happens, concentration drops down because the high TDS is leaving the system and new water is being fed to the system. Now, when the brine valve opens, the water in the last membranes leave the system in very high velocity, creating high shear force. Now, there are constant changes in osmotic and hydraulic conditions throughout the operation. So it's increase and decrease, increase and decrease. Now, if you compare it to a standard RO, the concentration will be constant. And in the PFRO, it oscillates. When we look at the brine flow in the PFRO, we can see that you only have brine flow during the flushing mode. Now, this is compared to the very constant brine flow in a typical RO, which is also three to four times lower in the shear force that is created. Now, this high shear force keeps the membranes clean and acts as some sort of a mechanical cleaning mechanism. But let's understand how scaling occurs. In order for crystals to form, some things have to happen. First of all, you have to operate long enough in order for them to form. And the formation of crystals include several stages of nucleation and crystal growth. Now, the time until here, basically, is called the induction time. The induction time is the minimum amount of time required for crystal to form. If we pass it, we will have scaling. If we don't pass it, we won't have scaling. Now, this is exactly what the PFRO tries to do. It doesn't allow enough induction time for the crystals to form and then no scaling is formed as well. Another important thing for a crystal to grow is to have very stable conditions, both hydraulic and osmotic. And again, the PFRO prevents that. We work at alternating flows and we have ever changing uh, changes in concentration. So we don't have stable conditions that allows crystals to form. So to summarize the advantages of PFRO solution, we design our skid to be modular in order to minimize civil and site work as much as possible. The PFRO is a solution that can reach high recoveries very low scaling tendency and also low tendency for biofouling as we will see in a second. Now this is a single stage arrangement for high recovery compa compared to a multi-stage configuration for typical RO. 
This obviously reduces CapEx. You have less interstage piping, less pumps, and so on. And it also allows for fewer membranes and pressure vessels. Now, in addition to low scaling and biofouling potential, operating costs will also be reduced because we use much less chemicals and less frequent cleaning than typical ROs. And finally, before we finish this part, one major advantage of both the Max H2O desalter and the PFRO is the ability to handle biofouling. Now we know that industrial water have concentration of organic loads. Some have more, some have less, but most of them have it. And one of the biggest limitations for typical RO technologies is that they don't handle organic loads very well. And as soon as you increase recovery, you will clog up the membranes with biofouling. Now we know that bacteria, they gain energy by metabolizing organic matter, but they waste energy on movement and adapting to changing conditions. Now in most technologies, as we just saw, the conditions are stable. TDS is stable, pressure is stable. And this gives the bacteria all the time in the world to grow, reproduce, and form biofouling. This limits the recovery. However, in the desalter and the PFRO, we change the osmolic and hydraulic conditions. Each does it in a slightly different way. The desalter is a cyclic operation. The PFRO has the pulse flow mode of, a, of operation. But both conditions basically change, both technologies change the conditions in a way that slows the reproduction rate dramatically because the bacteria have to adapt constantly to the new conditions. And as we mentioned, both technologies have high shear velocities, which also help to reduce biofouling as you have a mechanical chemical, a mechanical cleaning mechanism. So now that we, you have some idea on, on IDE's high recovery membrane based solutions, I'm very happy to present our new partnership with Chem Process Systems. This partnership will be highly beneficial for both as IDs wider range of low to medium salinity desalination and water treatment solutions will be complemented by chem process crystallizers and evaporators to provide the Indian industrial customers an end-to-end -end zero liquid discharge solution. Additionally, chem process will be able to utilize IDE's state-of-the-art centrifugal compressors in their evaporators which are already serving the water treatment industry for several decades. Now, by combining IDs, membranes, and thermal technologies with Chem Process wide portfolio, a joint solution will definitely address the full water treatment needs of all industrial clients that require either minimum or zero liquid discharge. So please let me introduce Chem Pros CEO, Mr. Jayesh Parik to tell us more a bit about thermal solutions and ZLD. Jayesh, please tell me when to uh, change the slides. Uh, thank you, Mutan. Uh, and that was very interesting for uh, all of us to introduce our technology to Indian industries, as well as the various organizations present in the, this forum. Uh, I am Jayesh and I would like to get, uh, you know, you introduce with the complete advantage what we are going to have for our industrial solutions as well as other solutions together with our global partner uh, ID from Israel. Uh, as Matan said very rightly that there are problems in uh, MEE or a thermal solutions and Though it is implemented, then it is compulsory where you have to have landlock area, where you have to get your water back, you have to go for ZLD. Though we have more than 1000 ME installations, we know it works, but it works with little pain. It works if your customer is rightly guided. It, it works if you have lots of challenges which we overcome by studying the infant and effluent coming to the ME after RO reject or directly stream from the industry. So in order to resolve this question, which I have been facing in various platforms, various seminars, that okay, ME is works, ME is ZLD is very expensive. So sometimes decision maker gets discouraged and always try to delay. But on the other hand, 
you have to implement it in order to overcome all those drawbacks and in order to have a step forward for the industries where industries can go with the with ease to implement these solutions we came across with id and the question which was always in the mind how to resolve this issue to reduce capex opex and efficiency we came with id camp advantages where we can now really able to provide you know most viable water solutions for the wastewater not only the solutions or designing or you know providing the architect how to do the solutions we also back up id with our excellent manufacturing base which is already approved by various international courts and standards and we have been serving to majority of the corporates here with the quality standards apart from that we also have our own pilot plant facilities which is approved r and d facilities where we get all kind of equipment all kind of small pilot plants we do study the effluent samples from the various industries from the whole whole spectrum of the industries may it be chemical heavy chemical pharmaceutical fertilizers mining and then we find it out the best possible way to optimize the me and thermal system which contains many other equipments also with id and with our local presence and a pool of very qualified engineers in cam engineering more than 100 engineers working with the various disciplines will be able to give complete local support to the indian industries and therefore we will be able to understand their systems their their affluent their demand very well and we can work very hand in hand with our partners id as you we are in this field for more than 30 years and we have vast industrial water designing experience and we have practical hands on experience of each kind of effluent because we saw very small plant to the large plant so we understand the chemistry the varying nature of the you know effluent the challenges what it happens challenges how to design the equipment challenges so all those we have hands on experience and therefore we will be able to support our customers together with id's very innovative technology which matan has already explained to you i'll elaborate more how it will help us and how it will help the industry so technology integrations together with experts from both the side from the id and from the cam process team we are very confident to serve the industries that they will get a real good solution which will help them in reducing their final objective of doing less opex capex and work with ease while handling the zld next slide patar so whole story is about energy optimization and equipment integrations when it comes to the fag and when you got high tds high cod streams coming from any source the particular assignment first assignment to us is how to do the energy optimization we need to study the steam availability cost of the steam waste heat available oil heating electrical cost so based on these we take the feed to the configure our complete equipment with the range of falling film type of operator force circulations thin film rising film now these are the heat transfer equipment they do the heat transfer and evaporate the water in a purer form and then we condense and take it as a recycling but doing this also we need certain other technologies to include which which needs thermal comp thermal tvr thermal vapor compression where we use high energy make the latent heat use and try to do more heat transfer and heat input to the equipment which are designed in maybe single double triple four or maybe eight effect depending on the quantity of to be handled so from me once the me it does its job the liquid goes to the saturation there will be precipitation of the salts which are reaching above saturation then the crystallization now crystallization also requires a careful study of the type of the salts involved and there we wet there we come into the picture by putting the right kind of crystallizers to support the emis output and get the total salts out through our crystallizers which may be vsl type or slow btb 
vacuum adiabatic crystallizations reactor type and scrapper type after crystallization obviously you need to get those salts out get all the precipitated impurities which may be calcium magnesium silica if id technology is not there this is what we have been doing so far and that were those were the main hindrance so getting as you go downwards the filtration also becomes a big challenge not only the energy or optimization then we have a right kind of filtration system we select the right kind of filter make it to the solid so that the handling of the solid is minimized bagging bagging is possible and it can be dumped right up to the solid waste side it might be far away from the industries so we have to take care of the filtration and ultimately drying also we have also complete range of drying our scope where it is very high organic load you need maybe atfd where it is crystalline salt it is easy to you know just do the you know the simple drying and also we while drying and uh, filtration we need to also look at the energy and the cost of waste disposal so whole complete integrations experience we bring together with id uh, on this platform come on next slide please this is a very basic uh, uh, informations and uh, typical diagram for understanding the evaporators what is evaporator evaporator is nothing but when you put any heat source onto the jacket side and when you put the water inside the tube it will start boiling be it falling film be it rising film be it for circulation and this vapor is being you know compressed and followed to the next stage now to do that what we need we need a heat source so this evaporators will require steam or power the evaporator can be designed with a steam using state steam if it is low pressure if it is high pressure we put thermo compressor to avail the advantage of recycling of the heat and where energy cost is less where the boiling point rise in other configuration we check there we also put mechanical compressor now coming to the falling film falling film is the most easiest the most favorable thing if i have a clean fluid i am very happy to use falling film up to the saturation when i say clean fluid means there is there should not be impurity which can go on the scaling as you see when we anybody talks about me the first question ask is we need scale when we have to do the cleaning so those time thing if with id desalter technology we will be able to control now me will get the the most hardest part which is most notorious part like calcium magnesium silica is not there and therefore like pfro we reach highest recovery here also we are at a ease this is how the falling film will be benefited right up to the saturation stage normally we appoint falling film where we got low power requirement low pressure drop requirement need to take advantage of high transfer rate because in falling film we can go very high transfer rate as i as 18000 1800 kilo calorie per meter square but the problem as i told you falling film cannot be deployed if it is very sensitive to the saturations hard iron calcium cations like calcium magnesium silica is present and not suitable for you know do crystallizations or precipitation so it will go to the next stage like matan next slide please once we have the falling film where we reach up to a controllable tds controllable non scaling tendency after that it will be transferred to a four circulation so it may be falling film combined with the four circulation the me is nothing but but pool of four or five or six epet and in between this heat transfer element may be falling or four circulation so when it comes to harder part we go for four circulation only the disadvantage in the four circulation you need to continue increase the velocity in the tube you have to maintain certain velocity you cannot go for the high head then power goes up so that optimization with respect to velocity heat transfer area and and the carry over tendency because we cannot go much higher velocity forming tendency all those we take care and then design for circulation evaporator with an objective to reduce the capex and optimize me plus falling for circulation so on matan next slide please 
this is a typical cross section of uh, you know tri triple effect evaporator in evaporator you have, you have a three or four effect where you evaporate in first body the vapor goes to the second jacket then it will, will give away the heat becomes the pure water goes into the condensate uh, collection tank then vapor will go forward to the next stage and this is how it goes on so with one kg of steam you can probably go eight or nine times if it is a simple me with tvr you can go up to six or seven effect and with mbr it's a different configuration altogether it is though a single stage but then we will boiling point is another thing come in picture so where the typical expertise come which kind of compressor to use those comes in me and it is run through those compressors all condensing water is pure condensate and goes back for the you know water usage recycling matan uh, previous slide please yes previous slide uh, next slide yeah now you see this is the most interesting slide i would like to discuss it in detail this is a comparison of zld typically uh, you will be able to understand your objective or any designer's objective is how to reduce the operation maintenance capex and opex when we came in touch with id this really attracted us that this can resolve the problem immediately with complete range of pool of integrating pool of you know equipment complete in what we need we need to knock out calcium magnesium silica and we need evaporator needs highest tds we are always happy to receive more tds so my evaporator becomes more compact less energy uh, and also capital investment goes down with desalter and pfro typically the feed is taken at 2% in general ro you look at in the red in conventional ro you get 2 to 4% while with id technology we are able to get right up to 10% now look at the figure if i we feed 5000 k 50000 kg per hour at 2% tds coming from the reject the rate of evaporation is more than 30000 37000 this is and if i have the same with conventional i get only 25000 i i get only 25000 as a permeate what we receive with the 10% and what we receive with the 4% is much higher so load on to the evaporator to do the evaporation job typically with the id technology we get only 10000 kg per hour for the evaporation and therefore accordingly all the requirement like heat transfer area utility all will depend on 10000 kg evaporation latent heat and we play with the heat and mass in me for multi staging for configuration so with 10% we are at much is to reduce load up to 10000 while in the case of conventional it is more than double so if you look very simply 50% reduction in simple your cost or pex capex goes down it's not only the equipment up to crystallizers or bagging you look at the peripheral like steam boiler requirement power requirement cooling tower requirement civil storage everything is compressed just by technological advantage coming from id then we simply we go to the crystallizer crystallize load is also almost same crystallize remains same because now all the salt has come to saturation so right above crystallizer then the filtration comes in picture so this give you the total idea about the load side now coming to the how it helps operation look at the desalter what matan has explained the enemy of thermal evaporators or any heat exchanger in the plant be it a simple cooling tower condensers or power condenser the enemy is the scaling it's the same enemy works at ro also with innovative ideas in this altar we are knocking out all those calcium magnesium silica the advantage to the me is not only fouling scaling reduction but also when it goes to filtration all calcium you know calcium chloride has very high boiling point as it keeps on accumulating we go for a purge in organic also same thing we need then big atf then atf is giving one is to one stream economy so all those systems we will be able to refine and reduce so we are more excited with the combination of these two technology matan next slide please this comes on our experience uh, on campuses uh, which we have done in past uh, and we have many such plants in the country with various 
corporates in India, uh, all chemical, pharma, fertilizers, mining, everywhere we have given these kind of solutions, but I'm giving you typical case study on United Phosphorus Limited, where we have handled 40,000 kiloliters per day, feed effluent containing 12% of the TDS, means 1,20,000 TDS, the three composition has got complex sodium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, pesticide, and all other impurities which we need to take care of by evaporation and crystallizations. The objective was to handle these pesticides very exotic water and comply the PCB norms, which we did very successfully by separating, you know, uh, uh, water and crystallize the salts and made complete ZLD. And such we have got more than thousand plants from small to big in the industry. So we can bring the, our rich experience, hands-on experience, practical experience, not only on the design or uh, manufacturing, but also erection, training the customers. We have got more than 40 field engineers who takes care of complete turnkey EPC contract and give final solutions to our customers for their happiness. Next slide, please, Matan. Next slide, Matan. Yeah, I went to the next slide. Yeah. This is a, again a similar case of Hindustan Zinc Limited. They are, you know, getting all aquifer water and their process water goes to the ETP. Then it goes to uh, RO system, conventional RO system. And from where we get 600 kL per day, very high hardness level. Now, as Matan said, in conventional RO, all impurities will come to the evaporator and evaporation job and thermal job becomes much harder. And in spite of that also, we have made this plant very successful. Of course, there we have used more power, more steam because of the all impurities comes. Had it been ID before in this plant, this plant would have come down to almost 50% on the OPEX and CAPEX. So this plant is running since plant 10 years. Now you look at the cost saving which customer would have availed with this technology. So I'm very happy that with the desalter and with PFR, everything will come down in such large applications. Matan, next slide, please. So friends, uh, it is a best uh, uh, combinations from ID, which is a global leader of partner with strong background also on chemistry. They also have mechanical vapor compressors and we understand compressor very well, which we outsource from the outside of the country so far, no good manufacturing in India. So I'm sure with MVC, with TVR, with all ME, with our IDs, you know, background and their experience on thermal also, we'll be able to do it really make in India local manufacturing. I'm sure all customers in India will get advantage on their CapEx and OPEX and their solutions requirement. All resources are available locally with IDA backup in Israel. And we shall be able to take full APC capabilities, which we have already done, or in maintenance services capabilities we have. And wherever required, we have got complete pilot plant facilities, R&D facilities with, with excellent engineers who can develop, you know, more innovative solutions, especially with a view that if we can even recover various byproducts, which we have already done for many customers. So getting byproducts, getting good water, getting, you know, all these things will be available with this joint strength together. Matan, next slide, please. Uh, no. No, oh, I think that's uh, I think that's the last slide. Um, before we finish uh, this webinar, I think it's important to uh, uh, again to notice IDE strategy in India, uh, and that's India for in, in India for India. Um, we are an Israeli company, and we already have and are expanding our local presence in India, both for engineering and manufacturing, to be able to provide together with Chem Process full. EPC and O&M services for projects in India that are basically cost effective. Uh, and as the Jayesh uh, very well mentioned, we are we have the options to carry out pilots and demonstration studies for innovative brine management solutions uh, and so on. And before kind of we finish the last slide and go to the panel for questions, uh, I want to summarize this webinar with a look to the future. Um, 2020 and forward is looking slightly different from the last decades in terms of customer, government, and the solution. From the customer point of view, uh, there is a wish to replace freshwater sources and focus on upstream treatment, 
with again with affordable and cost effective ZLD solutions. From the government point of view, there are more strict discharge stand, stand, uh, standards, and, and we see that it's only going to worsen with upcoming years. Uh, there is a stronger preference for local sourcing and also stricter rules on industrial expansions. And finally, in terms of so the solution, there is a higher localization by foreign players to try and provide cost-effective solutions. And this, in, this is in parallel to sustainability goals, which will drive more and more the needs and the projects. Um, so on behalf of IDE and Kempro, and before we go to the panel for questions, so uh, don't leave just yet, I wish to thank you all for taking part in today's webinar. I very, uh, very much hope you enjoyed it. And again, now we will have a wide panel for, uh, to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. If we can stop sharing the screen so that we can be on the grid view and see the other panelists as well now. I think uh, Mr. Matan, if you could stop the presentation share. Yes, thank you very much. I'll just quickly mention about the other panelists as well who've joined us today. Uh, so we also have with us, apart from uh, Mr. Matan and Mr. Jayesh, we have Mr. Leo Rashid, who is the product manager ID technologies. We have Mr. Mickey Trammer, who's VP sales and marketing ID technologies. Uh, we have Mr. Nain Shah, who's sales director at ID India. We have Mr. Toma Rifrat, who's director of business development and project manage, product management at ID Technologies Israel. Mr. Udayan Basu, who's senior manager industrial water business at IDE. We have Mr. Brijesh Patel, who's head of design and applications uh, chem process. And Ms. Nina Shah, who's director of business development at chem process. A very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, we already have about uh, 45 questions um, that have been posted here by the participants. So I'm going to take these questions uh, one by one and address it to specific people uh, on the panel. And we do hope that we'll be able to get answers to all these uh, questions today. So um, let me begin then uh, with the first question. And uh, the question is that how does uh, MVR compare with MEE in terms of life cycle cost? Uh, if Mr. Brijesh Patel could answer this one. Sir, if you could unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, now see, uh, as far as the life, life cycle cost of uh, MVR and uh, ME is concerned, we in India having two, uh, two kinds of uh, fuels using uh, across the industry. One is the solid fuel, which is normally coal, and uh, another is a liquid and uh, gas fuel where uh, we have uh, APO, diesel, CNG, all this. Now, when we are using solid fuel, normally steam cost is varying uh, uh, in between 1.5 rupees also and power cost all across is nearly eight rupees when we are talking of uh, plant having capacity of uh, more than uh, 100 kl a day normally per kiloliter of water evaporation per hour we have around uh, 100 lakhs of uh, saving across 10 years for uh, uh, mvr instead of using tv uh, instead of using ME with TVR or without TVR. And uh, when we are talking of uh, liquid or gas fuel, that saving is uh, normally increasing uh, up to 2.2 uh, to 2.4 CR for across 10 years per KL of water evaporation per hour basis. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, again for Mr. Brijesh Patel or Mr. Tomar. Any one of you can take it. The question is, in ZLT technology, what is the normal industrial practice for RO reject in case of uh, either industrial affluent or cooling tower blowdown uh, or sewage? Maybe Mr. Patel, since you are unmuted, you can start first and then Mr. Tomar can add on this. Yeah, okay. Uh, so for the RO reject and cooling tower blowdown, right now, actually what concentration we are getting across the industry is uh, in the range of... Uh, 20,000 uh, ppm TDS to uh, around uh, 45,000 ppm TDS. 
and uh, with uh, so much of hardness because uh, this uh, both the uh, waste water are having a hardness uh, more than 1500 to 2000 ppm which is very high for conventional ro so with that right now practice is uh, like uh, it is simply uh, going to evaporator where even uh, from beginning itself we need to use force circulation with uh, id uh, now means pfro and all those this concentration again goes up to 80000 to 1 lakh ppm of tds so load of evaporator will go at, at least 50% in any condition and then thermal uh, evaporator or mbr size will reduce by at least 50% okay and uh, mr tomar i don't see him uh, yeah i i will ask for uh sure, uh, um so yeah i think uh, brujesh uh, covered very very well um the normal practice is using typical ro and as uh, brujesh mentioned it's reaching uh, what typical ro can can get you to which is about 4%, 40,000 uh, ppm TDS. Um, to be honest, many cooling tower blowdown discharge uh, treatments are not not there yet because the um, it just wasn't cost effective enough to put one. So many of the cooling tower blowdown at the moment don't have treatment, and that's just water you can reuse and is not being used at the moment. Okay. Uh, next question is for you only, uh, Mr. Matan. Uh, what what are the typical TDS in every stage? um so i hope i understand the question what does it mean in every stage but um again the typical tds speed you can go in is is practically any you can go from very very low salinity both for the pfro and the the salter um from basically zero okay but but obviously not zero but from the 1000 2000 ppm tds uh, that's that's uh, uh, very well even lower And again, you can go up to the eight. We know exactly to design the system based on the feed TDS um, and where we want to go. Not all customers necessarily want to go to the eight percent TDS. Some would like to go lower, but from even even at lower salinities, they have challenges in terms of scaling. So the scaling issues and biofouling issues come very very fast. Not just at four percent; they can come already at one percent. Um, so it really depends on the water. but it's very flexible and it can practically receive any type of feed uh, tds in terms of the stages if i understand correctly from the desalter we work at uh, a local low uh, local uh, recovery in the desalter of about 20 to 30% so that's the concentration factor in each cycle in terms of the tds 20 to 30% recovery okay uh next question is that what exactly is meant by zld through uh, non thermal means and if you could give an example of that um so zld non thermal means um again zld is quite a a large term it doesn't necessarily mean always to reach 100% recovery so again it it really depends on what the customer needs um what i meant by that is pushing membrane based technologies as far as it can go um this is what i mean by zero liquid discharge with non thermal means obviously there are you know new technologies for even go non non membrane ones and not thermal ones to try and chemical ones to try and go even further but they're very very new um so the meaning of what i said is pushing membrane technology as far as it can go uh in terms of salinity okay um again next question is for uh, mr tomar and let me know who can address it maybe mr matan you can take it up uh, how much maximum cod bod silica etc are acceptable at high recovery membranes uh, so i think uh, the best one to answer this is uh, mr elio vesher please leo yes go ahead please leo yeah so uh, in regard to the organic content this is pretty much dependent on the recovery that you want to reach and other parameters including pH and temperature generally speaking and when we're talking about water reuse applications which is not exactly the case here but you can learn from it um normally toc of around 10 is standard and we do a recovery of, of 85 90% etc and of course if required we can always add and biological or other treatments as required in order to reach 
and the required feed, uh, feed concentration to the RO system. Okay, and uh, does the pretreatment uh, take care of up to 5 ppm presence of oil in ETP outlet? Again, for Mr. Lior. Yeah, so uh, in regard to oil, um, oil cannot be present uh, in the RO uh, to a very low limit. So um, pretreatment is required. Um, that can be done by various means, including uh, diffused air flotation, activated carbon, uh, filtration of many sorts. And uh, these, are, these are all common and typical uh, treatments, which can be added as required. Okay. And uh, would you have any references uh, to share on industrial ROs, which includes all features of high membrane recovery? And how does the OPEX compare with the conventional solution? Uh, maybe, uh, Mr. Mickey, if you would want to take that up. Uh, so you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, capex-wise, um, uh, cost-wise, uh, uh, the solution, the integrated solution we are talking about, is is on a life cycle uh, uh, analysis, uh, more effective than the uh, conventional um, RO and uh, and, and ZLD um, uh, uh, solutions. Uh, because of the integration and because of the um, uh, um, uh, the reduction in the size of the uh, of the more um, 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 expensive components, uh, we can reach a much uh, a more cost efficient uh, solution. Okay. And um, next question is that uh, along with the CT blowdown, can DM plant? Uh, regenerated water having high uh, sodium chloride can be processed or separate treatment will be required for that. Uh, any who can take this up? Maybe Mr. Matan, you can guide me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, I'll just repeat it. Along with CT blowdown, can yeah. DM plant regenerated water having high sodium chloride, can it be processed or a separate treatment uh, will be required? Um, again, we obviously need to know what, what the meaning by high uh, sodium chloride, but um, it's quite hard to answer like this. But again, if uh, uh, the specific person wishes to send a water analysis or specific data, we will be happy to uh, answer it uh, offline and send them um, an, a, a very elaborate uh, answer on that. It's just hard to answer. What high, whether we could or we need a, a different process uh, for this specific water he's referring to. Okay. Uh, Mr. Patel, next question for you. What is the capex of 25 KLD plant? Uh, see, uh, it's uh, without uh, analysis, it is very difficult to guess uh, what would be the capex. If we get uh, some wastewater parameter, then we can work it out and uh, can tell the estimated. Uh, uh, capex uh, uh, for the whole of the plant, whether it is integrated with RO or without RO, because in all the cases that capex will have a significant impact. Okay, and uh, Mr. Matan, the next one is for you. What is the moisture content at used pallets? So the moisture content is uh, ten, maximum 10%. Okay. And another question for you, uh, what is the limiting condition for the max H2O desalter that you spoke about? What are the limiting the conditions? Limiting condition. So again, osmotic pressure, uh, the, the, the desalter removes the, the water chemistry limitations. It removes salts from the water. So the limitations will, in terms of, of how high you can reach in recovery will be osmotic pressure. Obviously, if there are unique uh, substances in the water um, that may affect RO performance. This is something that we need to evaluate. And if pre treatment is needed to remove those, we will put it before the desalter. But in terms of water chemistry and, and, and the recovery we can reach, the limitation is the osmotic pressure of the water. Okay. I have a few questions for Mr. Lior now. Um, I'll just ask them. In the PFRO system, uh, how much can the recovery be increased to? Can it also be used for seawater desalination application? And uh, is the membrane here works in dead end and not on the cross flow mode? Uh, right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, three questions were asked. Um, first of all, in regarding to recovery, uh, recovery can be uh, determined according to the water composition. Um, generally speaking, we can uh, get to more than 90% and we can do that uh, if required. Even in two stages of TFRO, uh, first one will go up to, let's say, 88 or 90%. And second, done, second stage will do another 50 or more percent, altogether reaching up to 95%. But that is just generally speaking, it has to be, it has to be determined per case. There is no, there is no uh, uh, one size fits all here. And um, so that is in regard to the recovery. Second question um, was uh, in regard to the to seawater. So uh, PFRO generally uh, is not suited for, uh, for seawater, for seawater uh, that is typically uh, done for about uh, 50%, more or less, a little bit less. Uh, we use the standard SWRO. However, PFRO can be used uh, for second pass. In many cases, it is required to add a second pass of RO um, in order to, uh, to reduce uh, certain uh, certain ions uh, such as boron, etc., and for that uh, second pass TFRO can be used, uh, acting like standard BWRO. Generally speaking, TFRO um, is a technology that can be used for various applications, including water use, uh, industrial water treatment, BWRO, uh, etc. Um, all of those uh, all of those cases are relevant for TFRO. And uh, now there was another question, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, that's it. Uh, how much does the recovery increase to? Yeah, so I, I answered that. Recovery um, has to be determined per case. And for for yeah. some, some applications, more than 90%. Okay, and uh, the same gentleman also wants to know what is the typical cleaning frequency for uh, PFRO? Right. So one of the main benefits of PFRO is the ability to do uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning cycles, short cleaning cycles. Um, so we like to, we like to uh, look at it as, uh, as a preventive maintenance approach instead of doing CIP every uh, few months and letting the system deteriorate in between. We do, we do those frequent uh, cleanings that keep the membrane clean at all times. And the frequency of such cleanings, again, has to be determined per case depending on the, on the scaling, uh, uh, scaling conditions and the organic conditions that may uh, cause biofouling. Um, normally, uh, it is between two times a day or even once, one time a day to four times, depending, depending again on the, on, the, on the specific chemistry. Okay, so our uh, next question is also kind of related. Uh, can the mechanism for biofouling control in PFRO, which was explained in slide number 31, uh, be similarly applied for MBRs uh, for sewage or high strength wastewater treatment. Will the concept reduce biofouling in aerobic or anaerobic? Right. So, um, just just in, in continuation to the previous uh, question regarding this, the cleaning cycles, I just want to emphasize that the cleaning cycles themselves uh, happen in parallel, uh, in parallel to, the, to the standard operation, meaning that the system doesn't have to be shut down for that. The system uh, usually contains many pressure vessels. Some of them are in cleaning, some of them continue to operate. And generally speaking, uh, if the system is large enough, then, uh, then uh, production is continuous at all times. Now, uh, in regarding if this, uh, is, uh, if this technology is also relevant for MBR, et cetera, uh, my answer is pretty is, is probably no. I mean, we work uh, with RO membranes, not uh, UF-based membranes such as an MBR. And the whole uh, the whole concept of the cleanings uh, of uh, of uh, the PFRO is that you change hydraulic as well as osmotic conditions. So MBR, I guess, can can change the hydraulic conditions, but cannot really play with osmotic conditions. And uh, we all know that MBR actually utilizes. A, a, a shearing force velocity and uh, with all the bubbles, etc. So MBR already uh, uses the force of hydraulic conditions. Uh, I'm not sure about the alterations of it, uh, if, and if they do it cyclic, uh, but osmotic conditions are out of the question. Here. Okay, uh, next question for Mr. Jayesh. Uh, sorry, if you could unmute yourself. 
uh, there's this organization, the person from the organization wants to know that they face challenges in controlling foaming in ZLD. Uh, any specific solution you would like to recommend for reducing OPEX? See, foaming is very, very typical. And uh, say, for example, if it is organics, there are so many of organics load which causes swelling. We may have to look at the stripping option. Generally, WAPAT is given a stripper which we will remove and knock off the low water ties, which becomes, you know, cause of the foaming. Sometimes viscosity may be a problem. Sometimes pH also can be a problem. So all those three or four parameters we have to study and accordingly we have to devise mechanical uh, meaning uh, or uh, through some kind of, you know, anti-foaming uh, dose, uh, dosing. I mean, anti-foaming also we have to check depending on the viscosity and pH. So it will again, it can be done. We have uh, you know, many, many, many such plants and uh, foaming do take place. And again, dosing quantity and uh, cycle also has to be decided. So it is possible to you know study those and try to provide a good solution. Okay. Uh, next couple of questions for Mr. Nayan. Uh, if you could uh, unmute yourself now, sir. Uh, what is the gross, gross cost of product water of the desalter solution? See, if you compare the gross cost of the desalter solution with the conventional RO, I think it is much higher or I'll say the complex uh, treatment. So the, the right comparison would be the complete system and the, it's the cost per treatment for the integrated ZLD scheme. So if there is no downstream ZLD equipment and we are doing it just for the minimum liquid discharge or that, that kind of an opportunity, right? It is, it is not comparable to the conventional RO. So, uh, you know, without having the full data, it is difficult to answer this question, but we need to know the separation goal of the customer and overall scheme of the treatment. This can be holistically answered in that manner. Okay. Uh, next question is also for you, uh, Mr. Nayan. Uh, most of the participants have found the uh, PFRO technology quite interesting and they want to understand if there's a full scale industrial installation in India. So good question. I, I say, you know, it's, it's always the need and then the solution. So we have the, the demo unit available. So it is like it can be shipped to India. It is uh, readily can be deployed. But uh, it's, it's again, we need to know the what is the opportunity downstream and uh, what exactly is the filtration goal. So we are ready with those kind of solution. And as uh, we mentioned in the beginning about this, uh, uh, the whole partnership is, uh, it's not just about the integrating solution, but also about the manufacturing in India. We are proud to say that uh, most of the solutions what you've seen here is gonna get fabricated here in India and with our, uh, you know, the local supply chain for our global projects. So this is not uh, difficult and uh, it, the relevant opportunity always see that our investment on the demo units, it is pretty much, uh, we are geared up onto the same. Anything Mickey would like to add on to this? Uh, uh, no, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with everything you, uh, you, just, uh, you just mentioned. Um, our demo, demo unit is, is available and um, again, on a very short notice, can be, can be shipped and, and installed in, in, in India. Uh, but as you said, we need to understand the, the larger scheme and then what's, the, uh, what's the purpose of separation or what the purpose of treatment and to what extent uh, the client needs to go in that regard. Okay. Um... Mr. Ifrat, uh, would you be able to unmute yourself? Uh... Sure, I'm here. Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, I'll just ask you a couple of questions um, that are for you. Firstly, what are the installation uh, space advantage uh, that these technologies offer over other solutions? And what are the specific energy requirements for these technologies? So two separate questions. Maybe Mr. Matan okay. can also add after you answer. Uh, sure. Uh, with regard to space, um, if I understand correctly the question, I, I believe we are referring to the, to the footprint of the system. Um, when, it, uh, when we uh, relate to the PFRO, um, as, uh, as we indicated in the, um, in the presentation, the PFRO um, is a simplified uh, RO system where we use only one stage instead of three or sometimes even four stages 
in order to reach high recoveries. So in this regard, um, I believe that we can, uh, if you compare uh, the PFRO system to a three-stage system, um, the system is, is a, bit, uh, a bit smaller, but uh, I would say it's not something significant. I would say it's pretty much uh, uh, comparable to a, a standard RO, but more simplified in the way uh, the unit is uh, installed and operated. Um, this is for the first question. The second question was, please? Energy requirements. Ah, okay, so um, if we relate to the PFRO, so the, the, um, the uh, power consumption is uh, relatively similar to, the, uh, to a standard RO system. Um, I would say a little bit lower, but not something significant. I would go to uh, about uh, maybe 10% uh, lower in energy um, due to the fact that it's only one stage and not three stages and we are avoiding some of the delta P in the system. Uh, when we relate to the, to the desalter, here is uh, much more significant um, because the comparison is not for a, a standard RO system, um, and it's more uh, compared to, the, um, to a thermal solution. And um, when we uh, utilize the desalter, we are able to, uh, um, to use a significantly lower uh, power consumption. I would say in the range of uh, when, we, when we reach uh, um, high pressures and high salinities, we are in the range of uh, uh, I would say three kilowatt hour per cubic meter, something which is pretty uh, uh, pretty uh, similar to seawater RO, but very, very far from the power consumption um, that we are familiar with, with uh, thermal solutions that can reach 30, 40, 50, and sometimes even more than that, um, uh, for, uh, for treating uh, water that cannot be treated with membranes. So. With regard to the max desalter, I would say that the power consumption savings are uh, really significant. And once again, we need to, uh, of course, compare it case by case and, um, and see uh, how high we can push the, the, the desalter uh, compared to a standard RO and what would be the uh, specific power consumption that we would expect uh, from, uh, from a thermal solution. Okay, uh, Mr. Matan, anything to add there, on, especially on the energy requirements part? Um, I think uh, Thomas covered it. Uh, as he said, it depends. If, let's say, we're talking about cooling tower blowdown, and we can give an example, uh, obviously the energy requirements will vary based on whether you start from a low salinity point or, or a higher one. Uh, we have examples of where cooling tower blowdown, when we implement energy, uh, energy recovery systems, we're at the range of one and a half to two kilowatts per cubic meter of product. Um, if we start at a higher point, it can be 3.5. But again, the ranges really depends on the water quality. Um, and you have to always see uh, and compare it to the salinity you reach. It's very hard to compare energy recovery of a system that reaches 8% TDS and an uh, um, energy requirement of a system that only reaches half of it. Uh, so again, that's uh, all I can add. Okay, and uh, one more question for you is that what is the time duration of each RO cycle from filtration to bleed off concentrate, which reduces salt scaling and biological fouling? Uh, so I, I, I guess he relates to the cycle of the desalter until you reach the osmotic pressure. And again, it, it, it varies. It, we're talking about hours. It's not minutes. We're talking about it can be two hours, it can be six hours. It really depends on the water quality, depends on what types of salts you wish to remove, uh, the starting point of the salinity, the end point. Um, so it depends, but we're talking about from, we're, we're, we're usually talking about several and not too many hours. So three, four, let's say, you know, average. Okay, uh, next and the last question for Mr. Basu, please. If you could unmute yourself from, is there any, pilot plant available in India for PFRO and MAX uh, H2O? Uh, uh, currently, we don't have any pilot plant right away with us uh, in India, but as uh, we were discussed earlier uh, during the, uh, some of the questions we had, 
that uh, this PFRO pilots are readily available in locations out of India and can be shipped uh, at a very early time to the required destination and uh, is uh, available you know, uh, uh, for the customers who are willing to sort of look into it. Uh, maybe maybe I can add also to yeah, what, sure. uh, what Diane said. Uh, as he said, uh, very right, PFRO pilot is ready. It's here. It can be shipped anywhere. In terms of the desalter pilot, we have a design uh, for a demonstration unit ready, also with a local supplier in India to manufacture it. So uh, it also can be uh, quite fast manufactured in India and delivered to, to any client. All right, on that note, uh, we'll close the Q&A session then. Uh, I still see about uh, 15 more questions, but uh, the designated time for the webinar was till 12.30. So we are going to email uh, this, these questions to IDE, uh, to Mr. Shah, and then uh, maybe after that, uh, we can get answers to all of them uh, as well. Also, uh, a lot of the participants are asking about the presentation. Um, Mr. Nayan, if you would uh, want to comment on that, that will we be sharing the presentation? So we will send you the thanking note, those who all have attended, irrespective okay. of the time you remain on the this session. So we will send you the thanking note and specific request of yours because the full presentation might not be relevant for everyone, but yes. whatever is your specific question, query, separation, goal, or a ZLD, uh, you know, requirement, we can definitely address that. And, uh, you know, and, and that can be definitely initiated as a communication. So we are very much available and uh, you can reach out to us uh, uh, in the response of the thanking mail. We will send it to you. All right, and we, what we will also do is that we will give you a document compiled with all the questions that were asked today, whether they've been answered or not answered. And then uh, once you send the thank you note, you can also circulate the answers for the remaining participants as well on Absolutely. a case basis. Absolutely. All right, uh, with that, we'll close. Uh, thank you to all the few from IDE and uh, Chem Process Systems for joining us today. It was a very informative uh, session, and I hope that you all enjoyed being here and the participants also enjoyed the session as well. Thank you very much and uh, we look forward to further associating with you all for our future webinars as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much team from Indian Infrastructure, Ritika, Ashim Ashida and Mansi. So thank you so much. Have everyone a safe and a wonderful day ahead. Thank you sir.